Okay, good evening, everybody. We'll just get started in a, a couple seconds here. Alrighty, well, good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight, uh, taking some time out of your busy schedules to get a little bit of a COVID update. Um, we're reaching a point in the school year and in the pandemic where it seemed like it might be a good time to provide an update to you um, and, and help you to understand some of the things we're thinking about. Um, you know, as we watch the news and think about what's, uh, what's going on in, in the world right now, um, a, a quote that came to me was um, was this one here, which is that um, nothing in life is to be feared, only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Um, this was said by one of the heroes of my discipline in chemistry, Marie Curie. Um, I think that's really the intent here tonight is to be, to be providing some information so that things are less of a surprise as we move forward. Um, so to begin with, um, what I'd like to do is first off start by just saying a big thank you um, in line with our theme for the year, um, Mrs. Broder introduced our theme as being uh, community is about doing something together that makes belonging matter. Uh, Cardinals fly higher together. And that really exemplifies how our school communities handled the year so far. Um, if you look at every constituency, if you look at our, our uh, teachers who've continued to reinvent what they do, uh, teaching two classes at once, handling all the workload associated with that. Uh, if you look at our staff who in the background have made all kinds of systems work so we can manage quarantines and deal with uh, all the situations that come up around COVID. It's been an incredible amount of learning there. Um, and our, our parents have been tremendously understanding of all the bumps on the road and the things that we've uh, come across as we've had to navigate this, things we've had to cancel or change uh, on the fly as we go. Of course, our students who've really taken ownership for the uh, safety of our school community and really understood that they hold in their hands the ability to keep the school open through the year. Um, and so we're really proud of the school community. We're, we're really happy uh, with how the year's gone so far. If you'd said to us back in the summer that it would go so smoothly for the first two months, um, we probably would never have believed you. So um, the, the community's really risen to this. And so usually we end by saying thank you, but I think it's important to start the presentation tonight with a thank you. Um, so the purpose tonight is to give a fairly in-depth understanding of where we stand as a school at a pretty challenging point in the pandemic. Um, there are no surprises, so you don't need to wait for a bomb to drop somewhere in the middle of the presentation, um, but the hope here is to avoid future surprises. So that if things do come up in the future, um, you, you know where they're coming from and what we're thinking about. So we'll start at the global level, look at what's going on with the pandemic as we understand it, um, and then start to focus in more closely on how COVID is affecting us in schools. Um, there are some changes in the thinking about how we're going to handle COVID with decision making. I want to talk about the survey that many of you completed over the past couple weeks and what that means about our likely status for the winter. And then address some things that have been asked a lot. People are wondering about winter sports, um, academic concerns, mental health, holiday travel and recommendations. So we want to talk about all of those and then, then wrap things up. Um, and so there, there are um, several administrators here with us tonight. Um, Mrs. Linda Broder, our president. Mrs. Brenda Posnanski, our director of counseling and admission. Mr. Cody, our dean of student formation. And Mr. Gorell, our vice principal. And they are all manning the chat. So if questions come up that they can answer along the way, they will answer them. And then if there are any that need a lot of discussion, we'll cover those at the very end. Um, so again, this, this is uh, being recorded, so if you do have to drop off, it's being uh, put up on YouTube and Facebook, um, so you're more than welcome to, to join those later. So to begin, um, I just wanted to start with a little disclaimer, um, a quote by a, a, a very wise person who says, if, if no mistake you have made, losing you are a different game you should play. And that really is the, the summary of COVID. I think, is that at every step of the way, it seems like there's something new we learn, a surprise, 
um, something that changes. And so the disclaimer here is that anything I said and I could change tomorrow. Um, based on something new that is is understood, and we're we're going to be try, try to be open and transparent with everything tonight that is said, but our understanding of this pandemic is constantly evolving, and so things may change. Um, and so in the in the wake of the Yoda quote uh, today, Brother Larry, who many of you know, um, left in my mailbox um, one of the brothers' rules of life. Um, as, you, as you may know, the brothers of Sacred Heart commit themselves to following a series of rules. And rule of life number 150 is we adapt our ministry, our apostolate of education, to the needs of our time. We adapt. And we place in place with clear-sightedness, good sense, and boldness in order to give the best response to the Spirit's call. And I think that's a great summary of what the pandemic has meant. Um, it, it's a, a constant sense of adjustment and adaptation so that we can give our best response to the situation that's presented to us. Um, Starting off, a bit of really significant news from yesterday that I'm sure you, you um, noticed. I think it's important for our community to be thinking about is this news of a, a vaccine that is looking, looking fairly successful and looking like it, it may be effective in, um, in, in stopping the pandemic. And what's interesting about this is not necessarily that this is, is a perfect vaccine. It's not necessarily a vaccine that's going to be successful in the end. There are many candidates out there. But if you think about our year over the past year as being that road on the right with the bumps and the hills, uh, we keep talking about it being a marathon and not a sprint. And so the, there's, there's these twists and turns and things uh, come along on our path. Um, all these obstacles that, that can potentially get in the way. You know, and so funnel cloud in the distance. Um, there, there are always these kind of unexpected things this year that seem to keep coming out of nowhere. And with that news yesterday about the vaccine, I think the significance of that is that that tells us that somewhere out there is a finish line. And that if we're able to continue what we're doing throughout the course of the year, um, at some point we will reach a point where, where COVID is, is going to be in the past and we're able to get back to normal. And so with all the sacrifices and all the things we're doing, um, up until now, up until Monday, it's been pretty indeterminate that we actually would ever have um, a vaccine that works. And now we actually know that there is a possibility on the horizon there will likely be more. Um, and that tells us that all the sacrifices we're making are eventually going to uh, pay off and that, that will save lives and we'll eventually be able to move beyond this. Um, having that finite end is very important because I think we're, we're going into what's going to be a tough period of time with the pandemic. So if you look at the, the case counts over the past uh, couple of weeks, this is since the beginning of the pandemic. This is the average of cases each day. Um, last spring, we thought 30,000 cases a day was a lot. Over the summer, we thought 60,000 cases was a lot. Um, and over the past few days, we've been in the 120,000 cases uh, per day in the US. So we're definitely seeing a, an acceleration nationwide. Um, right now, a lot of that has been focused in the, the middle of the country. But what's very interesting about this is um, I, I found this chart last week that I think represents where we are. Along the bottom of the chart are, are the weeks since March. So um, you, can, you can see um, March, April, May, all the way through till now. And the boxes each represent a state. And the box says basically when did that state have its highest count of cases? So for example, Vermont and Maine set their record in March, which is kind of ironic. And as you know, they've had low cases for the most part since. Um, we heard a lot about New York in April and the cases that they had. Um, over the summer, we saw the pandemic move down to the south, southern part of the country, and also out west towards Arizona. But as we move towards now, what we see is last week, um, a, a, a major, uh, uh, not a majority, but many, many states, 23 states were setting their maximum all at the same time. So what had been a pandemic that was regional is really now um, one big surge across the country. And actually this, this was as of yesterday and as of today, several of those states had set a new record within the week we're in. So the pandemic is, is definitely accelerating. Uh, locally, we're in the same place. Um, if you look at the cases each day um, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, Massachusetts is a bit higher right now, um, but New Hampshire is where Massachusetts was and both states are starting to see the increases in the hospitalizations happening. Um, you, many of you have followed on our dashboard the risk index that we've set up, which is basically 
an estimate of how, how at risk is the average BG student based on all the communities that they come from. And so this is how it's evolved over time. The top green line shows that risk index since the, um, since the beginning of uh, March. And you can see that it peaked um, during, during the month of April or April and May. And now we're at the point where we've surpassed that. So right now we're at a much higher level even than, than we were when we were closed down in the midst of the uh, pandemic in the uh, springtime. The red line below is how locked down we are. Uh, it's based on the Google data. It basically looks at how much people move around. Um, and Google tracks that and reports that every couple days. Um, and so in, in the springtime, that red line going down uh, to, to a negative 50 basically says we were 50% less mobile then. Um, as we've gone through the summer, we were a little less mobile during the summer, but we, we picked up and it started to get a little higher as the summer went on. And now it's starting to trail off as, as I think folks are starting to realize the seriousness of the pandemic again. So you can kind of see how that's evolving. So right now the infections are higher than they were when we were dealing with this in the springtime. And also there's, there's less of a societal push towards um, distancing and, and not being out in public. So what is this meaning for schools? Um, now with some experience, we're starting to get some studies of school reopening amidst COVID. Um, and there are some indications, and this is definitely a point that's contested, and there's a lot of scientists and researchers saying different things on this point, but there are indications that opening schools is not linked to an increase in the infections in a given region. Um, there have been studies in Spain, Korea, Germany, Israel, the UK, among others, and those studies didn't seem to find a huge spike that says when schools are open, um, there's necessarily going to be a huge spike in cases. Um, there are also not many schools that are at the center of super spreader events, events where a lot of people get COVID, except for cases where precautions were not taken. We talked in the summertime about a school in Israel where they uh, disallowed their mask policy, they didn't socially distance, and all of a sudden a, per a huge percentage of the school had COVID. But uh, New York City's kept some great data on, on their school reopenings. They have not seen a, a excess of cases beyond what the community has seen. Um, the same is true of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. They've not seen a lot of cases in schools um, relative to a lot of the other things that seem to be carrying cases. Um, so this gives us a little bit of confidence being open where we weren't in the spring, but precautions are still critical. Um, and on October 29th, so under two weeks ago, um, a couple of epidemiologists who've been on the very cautious side uh, posted a paper that said this, that when there's a combination of limited mitigation, so when there are not things in place to prevent spread, and relatively high community transmission, so lots of cases in the community, there is evidence of robust a lot of spread in secondary schools and high schools. Okay, so this says if, if a high school opens and it doesn't take precautions, there are cases of spread of COVID. But the second highlighted piece says, if you add in me mechanisms such as social distancing, avoiding crowding, reduction in class size, widespread testing, and quarantine, um, these are the types of things you can put into place and these will help um, reduce that risk. Okay, so they're basically, the finding is if you, if you take the steps, you can have a school that's open at a higher level of um, COVID. And that's the, um, the message so far from the, the science. Um, so, you know, the, the story of COVID is always a story of it's not that simple. Like somebody will make a statement and then there's always a statement that can respond to that statement and you can go back and forth forever. So, you know, for example, we know that COVID continues to have a statistically low impact on young and healthy individuals, but we know it remains deadly for the elderly and the vulnerable. We know that many educators, parents and family members are in vulnerable categories. We know it can be carried into the home and transmitted by young people. This is actually undercounted in the, in the data because what's happened is because so many young people are asymptomatic, if somebody in a household gets sick, they test that person first and they assume they were the one that got COVID first and brought it into the household. And so they don't catch the, um, they don't catch the student who might have been asymptomatic and gotten it first and been the vector into the home. Um, cases in the young people are on the rise and some of them will have long-term complications. Uh, our brother's school in uh, Queens actually dealt with this significantly, that they had students who dealt with some of the um, autoimmune types of 
consequences. And there was a big study this summer of college students who had serious cardiac um, implications due to COVID. So there are some long-term complications that come up. And if, as more and more young people get COVID, some of them are gonna have these. Um, we're more effective at treating COVID. Death rates are low for many groups. That's good news, but rates are increasing. And when rates increase, hospitalizations always follow. If hospitals are overwhelmed, people won't be able to get the right care for COVID. If hospitals are full, many people won't be able to receive care for other treatable conditions. And if the medical workers get sick, they won't be available to take care of you. We know that herd immunity is likely still a very high infection rate. It would mean a lot of deaths to get there. And we know that a vaccine does offer us a finish line, but it's not likely to have a major impact until the spring or summer um, when we're, we'll see large numbers of doses. Another good news thing, there's little evidence of transmission of COVID in schools. There are significant downsides to having schools closed. We know that from a sense of mental health. It's not good to be locked in a, in a dark uh, bedroom attending classes seven day, five days a week. Um, and it's pretty safe to keep schools open at higher rates, but there are risks in high schools that we need to consider. And it's very important that distancing and low density and class size restrictions and masks and other things are, are very much essential. Um, and a point on the density comment, and, and this is, gets back to our cohorts, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the, when you look at, uh, there's a study just today that looked at Google data and how much people move around and where people are relative to outbreaks. And the biggest factor that slows the spread of COVID is reducing occupancy. So if you have a restaurant that's at 100%, this, this study showed that that restaurant is much more likely to have a big outbreak than a restaurant at 50% or 25%. Um, and the same is going to be true of schools and other settings. So we know we need to do that. So that's kind of the big picture of where we're at and the types of information we're looking at is we think it's safe to be in school. We think it's important to keep at a, a reasonably low level of uh, occupancy. We also think that we have to be careful in doing it. So we've shown this graph throughout the year, this, this chart. And basically there are, this is the, the chart that we essentially use and schools throughout the state of New Hampshire are using to determine what status they'll be in. And so on the vertical, you have how much school impact there is. So for example, this is talking about how many cases do you have? This is talking about, do you have enough staffing? You know, if all of your teachers are out on quarantine, that's gonna affect your ability to hold classes. Um, so it's, it's what's happening within your walls. And low basically means there's very low impact. There's a few cases here and there scattered. Most of your teachers are in. But as, as we get up to medium, then if, if we had a cluster three cases related, that would be considered a medium case. And if we had um, more uh, multiple clusters, we would consider to have a high level. Um, throughout the year, for the most part, we've stayed in the low category. And that is a tribute to our students and to our um, faculty and to our parents and supporting the expectations we have and supporting the quarantines we've put in place, the, uh, the rules about um, isolating when you're sick. Um, wearing masks, social distancing, all of those things have contributed to keeping our impact low over the course of the year. The level of community, community transmission, that's the number you look at on the website. That's how much COVID is in our broader community. Um, over the course of the year, we basically follow this arrow. We've stayed low in our school impact, but we've seen increasing levels, especially over the past month of COVID in our broader community. Uh, and that's, that's broad across most of the communities that we serve at Bishop Garden. And so that leaves us right now in this lower right category where we have about 160 cases over the past two weeks for every 100,000 people in our sort of viewing audience. And, um, and that leaves us in this zone of hybrid, um, which is we don't have cases at school or many of them, um, but we, but we are in a high level of community transition. So that's, that's how we got to where we are, all right? How do we move forward from this? Because the community levels are gonna continue to rise. And so this is a study out of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that, that's looked at school plans. And I'm not gonna read it to you, but basically what, what this study is saying is that at the beginning of the year, we looked at the community and what was going on with cases in the community. As we've moved through the year, the evidence has said you need to look more closely at what's happening in the school in making that decision. And so that's the transition. 
in the spring and summer, rates got a little high. Um, and so those those rates in the community were the number one consideration. Like we had a, a couple cases in New Hampshire and we shut the school down in March. And that was the best practice. And, and that's one of Yoda's points that knowing what we know now, we probably could have waited a little longer to do that. Um, but at the time we didn't know anything about COVID and we had no way to really project out where this was headed. Um, but now as we get into the late fall and winter, we're looking at the school rate, the cases in the building first and then community rate second. And I put a star because those are linked, obviously, that if there are more cases in the community, it's more likely that students or, or teachers are gonna arrive at the school with COVID. And so we're gonna see um, um, school impact rates go up as well. And so they are related to each other, but which one are we predominantly looking at? Right now, the, the one that's a, a make or break stat for us is how many cases of COVID do we have in our building? Um, so in terms of the community side and the rates, this is more just for your own um, benefit and things you can think of. Um, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and the CDC have all talked about what are they seeing that's causing this spike. Um, a big one is in-home transmission, that there's something like a 30 to 50% chance if somebody in your household gets COVID that you will get COVID. Um, so it, it, it's pretty significant how many of, of the um, transmissions are happening within the home. Small gatherings among individuals from different households are starting to cause a problem. So we heard about the super spreader events in the spring. Now it's the, the, the super spreader small party or small event um, where people are close to others in, in the indoors um, for a period of time, even if it might just be you know, another, another family or something like that. All of those people have the opportunity to uh, spread COVID. We've addressed this, uh, parties, large social gatherings, um, weddings, funerals, those types of things are, are big events right now that, that can cause spread. Any public place, restaurants, bars, religious worship locations, and gyms. Um, really anywhere you have crowds in contact for a long duration of time with poor ventilation and close spacing between people. And, and worse yet, while singing with no mask on. Um, sources of school-based transmission. So what causes COVID to be transmitted in the school? We don't, it's not the classroom. It's not the sports team. It's the stuff that goes on around them. Um, we talk about carpools and transportation. Um, and the, the faculty kind of laughs about this, that we go through social distancing all day and we do our thing and the kids leave the building, they, you know, the masks come off and six kids jump in a car and off they go. Um, and, and so a lot of what, what good happened uh, got, gets flushed down the drain. Even just cracking the window in that car can make, make a huge difference there. Um, but it's the, it's the transportation, it's social gatherings. You know, you've heard all, all fall about a team at this town or another that got COVID. And for the most part, that's because somebody had a party. Somebody threw a party. Uh, you know, team dinners, pasta parties, sleepovers, those types of things can be a real challenge. Um, shared spaces, locker rooms and weight rooms. We've, we've limited the use of the locker rooms, we've limited the use of the weight rooms because those are spaces that can be um, tricky. Um, and, and the students will love this. The, the real risk in a school um, in terms of COVID spread is the adult stuff. It's the faculty room, it's um, teachers in a meeting room. Um, even the teacher in the classroom, if they happen to have COVID, um, can be the, the biggest risk. And if, so if you go into any of our classrooms, there's a, a, a big red line on the front of the classroom and that line uh, indicates where you can and where the teacher can and can't be. And that's, that's an intent of separating the teacher from the students for the teacher's safety, but also if the teacher has COVID, they're the one talking loudly, spreading lots of droplets around the room. Um, and so to have that distance is very important. So basically school itself is not the, the issue. The issue is everything around the school itself. Um, in terms of our, so that's the community impact. That's what's happening around us in our, in the town and the area. In terms of the impact of COVID within the walls of BG, um, we've had six cases at BG uh, so far to date. I put a star next to cases and I'll come back to that. Um, the first one was in August, before, right as we were starting up, it was an outside adult who worked with one of our teams. Um, because they were outside and distance, there were no exposures uh, for students or staff in the end. We had a little uh, fire drill where we thought we were gonna have to quarantine the whole football team. Um, but in the end, we found out that we were able to release them because they weren't close enough for long enough. Um, on uh, September 15th and 16th, we had two student cases um, that were connected to each other, we think through an outside activity. Um, and those cases had numerous student exposures. So in each case, we had to go through every class 
and find the students who were sitting near the students who were uh, sick, and those students had to quarantine. And so there were quite a few, up to up to 30 in each case, and maybe even more than that, um, quarantines as a result of that. So we had a good number in each instance. Um, on on we had a quiet period of time, um, but then on on 10, 28, and 29, we had a couple other cases come in. And what's really important is by then we'd gone to cohorts, and so the spacing in the classrooms was better, and we had no student exposures in those cases. Um, and in, in a couple of those cases, the, there were quarantines already in progress, um, but in one case, the, the parcel was in the building and there were no exposures. Um, and then we've had another recent one, again, a staff member that was already quarantined and there were no BG exposures. Point being with these recent cases, as we've been in the 60% model, rather than having to wipe out 60, 70 students because we've had a couple cases, um, we've been really able to ride out these, these expo these um, cases with, with very few quarantines. Um, that's not to say we haven't had quarantines. As of uh, last week, we had 155 quarantines over the course of the year so far. So those are people who might have been in a class next to somebody um, in September. They might have been somebody who traveled out of New England. There was a period of time where there were hockey um, restrictions in place. Um, people who've had an outside, you know, friend or coworker or, or um, relative who's had COVID and they had to quarantine. So lots and lots of reasons why both in school and out of school, somebody would need to quarantine. Um, and we've dealt with quite a few of those. And again, if you, when you talk to Mrs. Cato or Nurse Turner, uh, please uh, thank them because they've had to figure this out over the course of the school year. Um, but what's really important is all of the BG cases can be traced to an outside exposure. So we don't have anybody in the school that got sick and we don't know why they got sick. And so as of now, we believe that we have had no in-school transmission events. And this is a result of all the precautions we have in place. And this is the most important point moving forward is if we can continue to do that, um, we can hope to keep cases low in the school. Now, one thing I will just say on the case rate, and the, there have been some questions because the state has a dashboard that occasionally would have different numbers. Um, some days we have more cases than others according to the state. Um, but on the dashboard that we are keeping, we're trying to keep every case that could possibly um, be counted as a BG case. And that's happening right here on the um, COVID dashboard. So if, if, a, if we're aware of a case, the case will appear there. The state may not count it if it's somebody that lives in Massachusetts. The state may not count it if it's somebody that, um, you know, they've been quarantined. But if in doubt, we're putting it up there because the, the goal here is to be as transparent as possible. There's nothing to be gained when we have a case from not learning from that case and, and having everybody in the community understand what happened. Um, there have been some questions lately because the information we released has been minimal. Um, that's two, two reasons there. One is confidentiality, obviously. The second is that in, in all of those cases, we believe that there was a minimal impact or no impact to BG students. And so there was really no reason to share more beyond that. And if, if we were in a situation where we had to share, we, we most certainly would uh, in order to make sure things are safe. So the school impact has been low so far, but we, we need to keep going. Um, we did ask about some of these things on our survey recently. So recently we gave a survey about uh, how, how is everybody feeling about being, being in school? and what's the current perception of safety within the school. Um, and so on this particular survey, a green was good. Green was very safe, the darkest green. Uh, the lighter green was mostly, and yellow was mixed. And very, very few chose orange or red to say that they felt unsafe within the school. Whenever I give a survey like this, I always like to look at the middle 50%. Um, you know, there are always lots of opinions out there, but but I think it's a good rule of thumb that if that middle 50% is accounted for in a decision, you're not going to leave anybody so far behind that, um, that, that they're uncomfortable with the outcome. And that's a, that's a result that our community can be very proud of. Um, and that's a, that's, it's everything. It's, it's, you know, Mr. Cody over the summer ordering dozens of ventilator or, um, of, um, air purifier units. Um, it's lots of work to distance classrooms. Um, it's adjustments by teachers, it's, it's students wearing masks and keeping distant. All of those things add to a, a pretty strong perception of safety within the school community. There is a bit of a gap on all of these survey questions between parents, teachers, and students. 
and the students and teachers tend to come out closer to each other. Uh, my theory on that is that, that there's a, a difference in being here during the day in that you do pick up on all the little things that go wrong, that we're doing a great job, but it's not perfect. And so anybody that's in the building has had that experience where they walk into a room and there's too many people in the room or they, uh, somebody forgets to put a mask on and they're in a crowded spot or things like that that can affect your, your sense of safety. And I think it's, it's easier to see those if you're here. Um, obviously, if you're a parent, those aren't things we're advertising, but they're the things we have to work out in the realities of, of education. Um, so we, we do see that there's a higher rate of, of, um, of mixed feelings about safety among teachers and students who are in the building. Um, but again, it's a, it's a pretty solid result. We asked, how do you feel about being at a particular occupancy level? Um, and so this is how many people felt safe at each level. So how many people felt safe? And again, at full, and this was a week ago, so cases have gotten a little higher. Probably these numbers have taken a little bit of a dip if we did it today. But uh, a good number, amount of our community would, would feel safe at a full occupancy level. Um, a little bit uh, more so would feel, feel good about the 80%. And then we saw a big gain at the 60% cohort and not so much of a gain to go to 40 or 20. And again, if you look at what's the middle 50% feeling, um, at that 60%, we've, we've accounted for all of them. At the 80% cohort, we've, we've accounted for just about all of them. For the full, we start to really creep into that zone where, where people in that middle 50% are gonna be uncomfortable. Um, and that, that actually informs us. We can, we can look at what, where we're at with 60%, and say it really doesn't pay much to go to a 40 or a 20%. You know, it doesn't pay us much to go down. We're doing a good job spacing now. People feel comfortable with the spacing that's existing. So that probably eliminates the 40 or 20% from, from um, what we would do moving forward. Um, and then there was the preferred operating mode. Um, what, do, what do we wanna be at? Um, students and teachers were actually very close to each other, about 20% about, uh, preferring all in. Um, there is obviously the wear and tear that happens on people doing hybrid learning. It's tough on the teachers, it's tough on the students, and I think that's reflected well there. Um, but most of that group was in the 80% in the, uh, or 60% cohorts, um, and we're now at 60%. Uh, parents, it, it was a more strong um, leaning towards being 100% in. Um, again, the challenge there is I think some of that is also reflective of not seeing kind of the day-to-day you know, oops, that hallway was really busy, that stairwell was really crowded. Um, those types of moments that, that are gonna be inevitable as we do this. So based on the survey, based on everything we've collected, how does this, how do we change our school status and how do we look at our, our status moving forward? Back in, and this is, whoops, this is, uh, this is just basically showing how do we go from green to yellow to red. So here's our risk index. Okay, and back in the springtime, as soon as there was a case within 100 miles, we were red. Okay, so that was easy. Um, that it really, the threshold for shifting to remote was um, very, very low because uh, we didn't know any better at all at that point. In the fall, we basically said we would be in yellow, all students in school, up to about 50 cases per 100,000. And then we would start to transition into increasing levels of orange. So we'd have 80%, 60%, 40%, 20%. <laughs> um, and then around 100, which is well in the rearview mirror at this point, we would be transitioning to remote learning. Now our thinking is more, you know, the yellow still needs a pretty low level of cases. But now the thinking is we would let orange go much higher because we feel like we can maintain the protections and the safeguards that we have in place because we have had a relatively low school impact. Um, and because the evidence seems to suggest that if, if you have the precautions and if you reduce the density of the school, um, you can be safe there. Okay, so the, the cutoffs have evolved over time. And probably by the time we get to springtime, that place where we can go back to 100% is gonna be higher. We're gonna know even more by then. Uh, we're gonna be able to benefit from the outdoor dining and things like that that we may lose in the winter. And so where, where does that leave us? What are the takeaways from this? Um, you know, first off, everybody wants to be in school. And one of the questions on the survey is, well, why don't you just let everybody who wants to be in be in and those who, uh, those who wanna have a lower status do that. And if you work out the math, um, say 40% of the people chose to be in um, all the time, 
that leaves 20% occupancy for the other 60%. So everybody else would then be in one out of three days. And so basically that decision by some number of people that they're gonna be there every day is gonna take away from the ability of the people who are really interested in that hybrid experience, that they wanna be in school, um, and um, but, but they're not comfortable with being there with 100% of the people. So we have to consider the whole community in this, um, but everybody wants to be in school. From the, the person who's the most cautious, is remote right now, is concerned about a relative, the teacher who's the most concerned, at the end of the day, we all wanna be here. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out the risks and, and whether, whether it's safe for a particular person. There's a higher confidence in keeping schools open at a higher rate. You've heard this from governors of both New Hampshire and Massachusetts lately. Um, the New Hampshire Department of Health is really pushing this idea that says you don't have to close just because rates are higher. But a lot of the messaging about the precautions is getting lost, that you, you can't do it unless you keep the precautions in place. Um, we're trying to stay away from red unless there's an executive order or unless there's an increasing impact in the school. You know, if tomorrow we find out that there are th there's a cluster of three or four cases, we're probably going to be remote for a period of time. We don't see that we'd likely go to orange below 60%. So we don't see that we go to two out of five or one out of five um, likely. Um, I, I say unlikely because nothing's impossible. There might be a circumstance where that's a useful thing to do and if so we'll do it but um, we don't we don't see the benefit at this moment of doing that so our current intention is to stay at 60 percent as the cases go up if the cases go down to increase to 80 percent when we can and once we see a real substantial sustained decline to a safe level to to look at going back to yellow um, some people have said you know well, school being in school is safe why not why isn't bg going all in like and i just Put, it, put a name of a school blank there, fill in the blank of a school you know that's all in. Um, why aren't we doing it? And first off, it's, it's managing risk. It's, it's much riskier to return to that yellow status during the winter months because of the lack of spacing, because of lunches, hallways, and class size. And the important thing that needs to be said is we are very close to capacity as compared to the schools that are doing this. Um, when you look at there's a large public school in New Hampshire that is all in 100%, and that public school had a had a school enrollment double what it is now at one point about 15 years ago so that building is relatively empty they're already de-densified relative to us there are some small catholic schools out there that are, are low in enrollment and they're they're able to do it because they can pull off spacing that we can't pull off and so to that point about why why are we not able to do it, it it's it, it's it may not be safe for us because we don't have the space inside um, that, um, that schools that are empty are due. Um, and the last thing to just keep in mind, I'll keep saying it, green is coming. Um, it, we probably won't ever feel normal during 2020 and even beyond that. Um, we're in a couple difficult months, but as we get to springtime, it will be brighter. As we get to summertime, we'll start to see some, some of the stuff we value being able to do, um, happening. Uh, and so again, we, we know that we just have to get through the time. On to the survey a little bit. There was a lot of overwhelming positive feedback. People really felt good about where we are with our protocols and our adherence to them. Um, concerns that came up, um, a lot of people referenced outside of school decisions, behavior, gatherings, compliance. You know, the message is, well, BG, you're doing a great job, but as students leave the school, they're making some decisions that are, are not supporting um, what we're trying to do. You know, the question is, are the quarantine requirements being followed? There are concerns about parties and gatherings happening, people who feel like the rules don't apply to them. There are concerns about what people are gonna do over the holidays if people are gonna ignore the guidelines. Um, lots of concern about lunch periods. Lunch periods is an active um, process that we're, we're working out. Um, that's gonna require a lot of experimentation through the winter. That is the most challenging part of our day is lunch. Um, some questions about safety protocols um, is, Stu a lot of people mention students who, when they're outside, aren't wearing masks as much as they should be. Um, and also even indoors, that people are forgetting to wear masks. As we get into winter months and the ventilation isn't as good, that's something we're gonna have to continue reminding ourselves. Um, questions about are we doing as well with hand washing and hygiene as we, um, as we said we would. Um, we've definitely kicked up the cleaning regime since the survey based on that feedback. Um, and, and also hand washing and for any students on the, on the call here, 
um, the idea of using hand sanitizer whenever possible. Some concerns about hallway crowding, we're continuing to monitor that. Um, if a student sees a spot where the hallway is crowded, uh, it's really helpful for them to point that out to us because we may not be there and see that and uh, we help knowing where those locations are would be helpful. Um, and then the, the ventilation issue. Um, it's getting cold. Um, there's a tension between dress code and, and temperature. Um, we have worked on uh, some dress code options. Um, Mr. Cody and Mrs. Rio put together some, some options in terms of sweatshirts um, that you can order. So th those will be in effect just for this year, but, but it's an option for um, improving temperature. Um, but we will be generally running a pretty cool building this, uh, this winter time because it is safer to get fresh air within the building. Winter sports, that was a big question. Um, the hope, you know, we're in the process of evaluating. The hope is to offer all sports in some format. There's a pretty good chance high community spread could disrupt this. And especially in the next couple of weeks, a lot of teams are doing open gyms and things like that. And, and those may have to um, get closed off pretty soon because the cases are getting very high in our community. And um, we're, we're never gonna sacrifice the in-person opportunity to be in school for a sport or an extracurricular program. So um, if that's a way we could protect the, the community, that's, that's something we're gonna have to look at. Um, there are some sports that we're concerned about. Um, wrestling, um, there is a lot of close extended contact, obviously there that is a significant concern. Um, we're gonna have to see that mitigated. Um, ice hockey has been a challenge. If you follow the news, there've been a lot of outbreaks during the fall. Um, there are a lot of restrictions in place. Um, our team is based at a rink in Massachusetts, and they just found out that um, Massachusetts won't entertain any New Hampshire-based athletes in the state playing hockey. So there are some challenges ahead in order to figure out where, um, where we're playing those games. Um, you know, we've priced out an indoor rink or an outdoor rink here at school. That's not feasible. Um, and uh, a lot of sports that are venue dependent. So, for example, swimming, you need a pool. The, 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 the venue has to accept you. Uh, indoor track generally needs a college facility, and that college needs to offer that. The ski resort needs to welcome the school in. And we're seeing that many venues are going to choose to decline events, um, and that's going to be a bigger challenge in the winter time than it is in the, in the fall and spring. Um, we should expect that spectators will be extremely minimal. Um, some com communities are already talking about no spectators at winter sports. We're going to evaluate that. Um, but the more people you put in a closed space, we know the, the more trouble you're looking for here. So um, if that comes to pass, we will be prepared for live streaming. Um, it's not just a sports, but an activities decision. We're postponing a lot of in-person gatherings for other activities right now. Um, we have a couple big ceremonies coming up, our NHS induction, a junior ring ceremony. And we want to do those things in person. Um, and we just don't feel good about getting a group of people together at this point in time. So a lot of those events are going to be pushed off for a while. Um, so practices start at the end of November. Um, games will start in January. So games will start very late um, this year. Um, and there's, a, there's going to be a hard shutdown of all athletics. And this is actually a statewide agreement over the Christmas break. So you will not see any Christmas time tournaments. Um, there, there should not be any practices, any team workouts, any activities whatsoever um, during that break. And that's, that's meant as a way to um, kind of keep people apart, uh, manage any challenges that come up around travel and, and make sure that teams don't become a source of spread. Mental health and well-being came up a lot on the survey. It comes up a lot in discussions around the school. Um, there are lots of concerns about mental well-being, screen time, and the long-term impacts of COVID on students and adults. It's important to note that school under normal circumstances brings a lot of pressure. Um, BG is an intense school. Uh, students are learning time management, how to, how to earn good grades, how to deal with the college process, lots of study skills. And then COVID adds a layer of uncertainty and disconnection that affects all of us and has a cumulative impact as we interact with each other. You know, so over the course of the day, if I interact with 10 people and all of those 10 people are a little bit uncomfortable and, and a little bit under stress, that's gonna have an impact on me. And then when I interact with, with my 10 people, um, I'm gonna have an impact on them. And that, that general stress level that we all feel um, is, is having an impact on interactions among people everywhere. So students who are new to the building find it hard to connect. Many students within the building who've been here, even seniors and juniors who are very comfortable are feeling worn down by all of it. Um, and the most important thing we can do as a school to combat this is to stay open. 
Um, we do not want to have these long stretches of weeks where students are just staring at Zoom. That's, we don't think that's healthy. Um, so the most important strategy is to stay open. If you are concerned about mental health, please don't hesitate to seek help. The school counselor is a great resource and can connect you with resources if you need them. Um, and in, in any case, any adult at BG can also help. So don't hesitate if, 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 you, are, if, if you as a student or if you're a parent who has a student who's struggling, don't hesitate to seek help. Um, and the other thing is a message that, that we always say, Mr. Cody always says this at the beginning of the school year, um, students look out for each other. Um, that's part of being a community. Um, don't hesitate to speak up if you're worried about somebody, if you think somebody's going through things, um, if, if you think somebody might harm themselves, if somebody's struggling with an addiction. Um, people worry about losing friends, but really this is the best way to be a friend is to, to seek out help if, if you think somebody's, somebody's struggling. Uh, this is never going to be the wrong decision. So um, if you are worried about somebody, please, 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 please speak up. And last point is we're going to strive as a school to break up the long periods of high intensity. Um, we've placed some professional development days. This is a very light week this week. Um, and we're going to try to place some of those at strategic places when we have several full weeks where we know that students are kind of coming and going, spending a lot of time online, maybe getting behind in schoolwork, uh, break those up and just give a little chance to relax and decompress and catch up on work and, and sleep and such. One challenge that came up was academic integrity um, and considerations around cheating. Um, it's, it's very much apparent that the remote testing environment is different from the in-person one. And so some students are using this to gain an unfair advantage. As a school year, this year is based on trust. And so we can't get through COVID at all without trust. We, we know that the reality is some people are gonna to choose to abuse this. We regret that. And that's not who we want students at BG to be. Um, the, the guarantee here is that if people who are acting with integrity are getting the most out of their experience. That's, that's the good news. That if you're a student in a class who's making the effort, who's doing the honest work, who's studying for the test, um, you're doing the things that it takes to prepare yourself for your future, um, future endeavors. For those who aren't, um, the, the bottom line is this, academic integrity is an expectation. Um, that expectation doesn't change during tough times. And so academic dishonesty is not something we'll tolerate. As a school, we remain committed to our honor code. Um, we'll address issues that arise. And uh, we also wanna remind students that reporting issues of academic dishonesty is a part of our honor code as well. Um, didn't appear there, but that uh, statement number nine on the honor code basically says, bystanders to acts that violate this code of honorable conduct share responsibility with those who directly participate in the acts. Um, the best statement of the character of a community is what it's willing to tolerate and not tolerate. And if, if you're a student and you're, you're looking at a situation and you're saying that it's unfair, uh, just know that you have permission to say, not, not in my school, this is not okay. Um, this is not what we stand for. We stand for something better. So um, all community members do have a role in this. And, and we have seen over the past couple of weeks that a lot of students are getting very frustrated with those few who aren't doing the right thing um, and doing the right thing and coming forward. Um, cheating is a self-destructive cycle. You know, you don't know the material, you cheat. Maybe you do better than you should have. You still don't know the material, so you cheat a little more. Um, and your, your understanding keeps going down and down and down. Um, and at some point you're, you're in the cycle where you have no choice but to cheat. So the important thing is ask for help. Um, our teachers understand the circumstance. They are aware that this is a really crazy year. If somebody gets behind, they're, they're liable. If, if that student shows up and says, look, all these things happened, it, it caught up with me and I didn't get a chance to study. Um, oftentimes that teacher will work something out. So it's much more useful and valuable to ask for help um, than it is to, to uh, misrepresent what you've learned. And we are talking about midterms in some form or another. Um, and, and we're gonna design this in a way that requires safe but in-person completion. So there will be a level playing field coming up uh, in the future. And this is a great opportunity for the students who've been doing the right thing over the course of the semester to demonstrate what they've learned. All right, getting near the end here. Um, holidays, lots of people talking about holidays. Um, I have a quote here, which I won't read from Dr. Francis Collins. He's the director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Anthony Fauci's boss, actually, and he interestingly is also a, a huge advocate for um, religion and science and their compatibility with each other. Um, so it's an interesting person to read. He's re written some books on his faith and, and also science. 
Um, but but here he's basically saying his family has decided they're not going to do a family gathering at, at Thanksgiving time. Um, and that is the guidance we've been given. So at this point, our, our position on Thanksgiving and the holidays is we're intending to be open when we come back. Um, we want to support the people who are following the guidance. And we know that every family's got a circumstance. We know that you might have an urgent reason you need to be in a different state or with a relative. Um, but we, we really want to support those who choose to just kind of have a low key holiday season um, and try to minimize the spread of COVID. Uh, Canada celebrated its Thanksgiving recently um, and they had a bit of a spike as a result of that. So uh, we're, we're expecting the same thing. If the rates keep going up over the next couple of weeks and people do their usual thing at Thanksgiving, it's going to be an absolute disaster. Um, so we want to support that. We're going to we're going to try to stay open. Obviously, circumstances may overtake us in that, um, but that that's the goal in the end. Interesting chart here. More of that Google data. Um, they went. What percentage of people in each state actually follow the quarantine requirements of that state? Um, and you can see here it's a pretty low percentage uh, across most states. The only difference with Hawaii is that it's enforced and there's a big fine. Um, but whereas most of the states has been a voluntary thing and, and the compliance with quarantine that if you travel, um, you have to stay out for a certain number amount of time or get tested or whatever the case may be by state. Um, it's only 10 to 20 percent. And in order for our community to weather the holidays, we're going to need to do better than that. If you if you travel, please be honest about it. Please. Uh, um, let us know that you did take the time remote um, and come back when you know that you're safe so that we don't have any spread. So those are some of the key points that came out of the survey. Um, you know, if you look at our crazy little road here, um, as we go into the next mile of this road, um, we're going to need your help um, and continue to need your help. Our community has been phenomenal and inspiring uh, thus far. Um, and we need to kind of continue those things, even though we may feel fatigued. We know that there's an end in sight to this pandemic. Um, I presented this to students at the beginning of the year, and I'll present it again because there are more layers. Um, th there's a model that's, that's talked about in, in preventing respiratory disease called the Swiss cheese model. And basically what you do is if you think about Swiss cheese, Swiss cheese, each layer has holes in it. And so you can't really use Swiss cheese as a good barrier. But if you start to stack up slices of Swiss cheese, the holes line up on different slices in, in ways that cover up the holes of the other slice. And so each slice is not perfect. It's, it's an imperfect um, way to control anything. But if you stack lots and lots of slices, lots and lots of layers of imperfect protections, you can actually be pretty safe. And some of these things are, are some of these layers in, in a pandemic are things we individually do. You know, being distant, staying home if you're sick, wearing masks, washing your hands. Um, having short periods of interaction with people rather than long periods. And some of them are shared responsibilities, having testing. Um, you know, BG has some leads now that, that um, are, are going to allow us to do some testing quickly if we need to, if we have an exposure or something along those lines. Um, ventilation, air filtration, um, what the government says and does, um, quarantines and isolations and eventually vaccines. So if you stack a big stack of Swiss cheese, you can, you can protect against the spread of, of COVID. And that, that's really the message, is if we all take responsibility for those pieces that we can control, um, we can eventually defeat this. So, um, you know, along the lines of COVID stops with a cardinal, some things you can do to help as we close off. One is stay home if you're sick. You don't have to be really sick. If you have sniffles, if you have a headache, if you have a stomach ache, really any symptom that's unexplained and new um, that isn't part of a pattern of symptoms like an allergy that you usually have, you really should be staying home. Um, and get tested. Um, there are a number of options that can provide uh, rapid testing now um, and, and oftentimes covered by insurances, um, even if you have minor symptoms. And the good news is if you get tested and you're negative, once you're, once you're better from whatever symptoms those are, you can come right back. Um, report symptoms right away or positive tests to the school nurse. So if you have a positive test in your family, um, please let the nurse know. Um, if you have any symptoms, if you're quarantining for any reason, let the nurse know. She can give you guidance in terms of um, what you should be doing for testing. Um, you know, should you get a test? When do you get the test? Those types of questions. Continue to wear your mask everywhere you go. Wash your hands whenever you can. Avoid loud, lar lar large crowds in loud crowds or gatherings, especially indoors. Um, 
minimize the smaller gatherings that you have. You know, even those those little neighborhood gatherings or gatherings with a small group of friends can be risky. Limit the time you spend in confined space with others. Time is a big factor in spreading COVID. So if you're if you're with a group, try to try to be with the group for 20 minutes rather than with the group for three hours. Ventilate your surroundings as much as you can, and respect quarantines if you travel or you're exposed. Um, those are some of the most important things we're seeing and becoming aware of um, as we go. So uh, th this mission has been accepted by our students over the course of the year. Um, we are incredibly proud as a, sc as a school of them um, and making sure that COVID stops with the Cardinal. Um, we, we are excited to be where we are. We know that there are challenges ahead. You know, we know that we could turn the page tomorrow and have cases or have to make an adjustment, but um, we're, we're happy with, with how the year's gone so far. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing this journey with all of you, um, and and we know that we can do it as a community. We know we can get it to, to that finish line. So um, that's the end of my official presentation here. Um, I don't know if there have been any chat questions that we need that need attention, but if you have any questions, this is a great time to uh, enter enter those questions into the chat, um, and we'll we'll see what we can answer. Mr. Mr. Strinisty? Yes. Uh, there was a question earlier in the chat. Um, or a parent was inquiring as to whether we had any data as to how effective the air purifiers have been in the classroom? The, there's, there's not necessarily data on, on the air purifiers effectiveness within the classroom. Um, there is data in terms of the, the effectiveness in general of air purifiers. So the, the, the simplest um, stage of those purifiers is a simple HEPA filter, um, which is known to basically eat up uh, the viruses that we're talking about in the air. Um, and so that will, that, that's pretty much guaranteed to work. There are also some UV components that are a little more um, experimental and new um, that are, are not known particularly well, but um, there is data in general that says a HEPA filter is sufficient to, um, to stop a COVID, to stop COVID uh, in the air. Chris, uh, oh, um, go ahead, sorry. Uh, a second question that came up in the in the chat was, will we be requiring students to become to be vaccinated? We're we're way past there. I think we would probably be following whatever mandate existed um, at the state and regional level that there there are currently uh, vaccine requirements for schools that are established by the state uh, health department. There are also reasons why there can be an exemption. For those from those vaccines because we know that vaccines are a controversial topic but bg on its own is not going to wake up one morning and say you know you must be vaccinated because we feel like it we we do not have the um scientific apparatus to evaluate a vaccine to that degree where we could we could establish that so if there is a mandate of a vaccine in the state we would obviously be following that and being be on board with that um, but we wouldn't be creating that on on our own Mr. Shrinsky, could you just clarify um, what you said about BG working on a plan to test students at school? Sure. Um, the, there is no plan to test students or screen students. That is happening in some states. Our, our brother school in New York City is testing some percentage of their students every single day as part of a New York State initiative. Um, New Hampshire has taken the position that they really don't want testing done in the schools. Um, the fear is that symptomatic people would come to the school and they would, in the process of getting tested, infect the school nurse and whoever else they come in contact with. Um, so the, the, the state of New Hampshire wants testing to happen um, at, the, at the healthcare facility. Um, so right now, the conversation around testing has been that we would, we would utilize the resources we've accumulated. We have a partnership developing pretty strongly with St. Joseph Hospital, another strong Catholic institution in Nashua. Um, and they would be able if we sent somebody over with symptoms to, to do a rapid test and to, to get somebody in so you could avoid some of the weights that you're seeing at the urgent cares and things like that so the the testing case we're talking about right now would be a case that says um, somebody comes in they're symptomatic somebody reports to us they're symptomatic we all want an answer quickly we set them up and, and send them over for testing and they get tested um, but there's not a plan right now to have a mandatory testing piece in place The uh, the rating on the filters, I, they're HEPA filters. I, I want to say they're they're twenty, um, a twenty rating on a HEPA filter, um, but I don't have that in front of me. Gosh. 
it's greater than 16. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Sturgisia, uh, a question was asked about if there are plans for um, midterms other than in person. Um, and, and that is something that we that we have discussed, right? Right now, the, the goal is to offer midterm exams in person. Um, as Mr. Strinsky alluded to earlier in the presentation, there are real challenges uh, with hybrid assessment, um, and it would certainly be much greater challenges with a uh, hybrid situation with students at home and students in school as it pertains to a high stakes exam like a like a midterm. So that that is something we'd have to discuss a little bit more before we could give a definitive answer uh, to that question. But right now, our goal is to have in person midterm exams. Mm -hmm. And we are not considering uh, the two weeks of remote learning following Christmas. Is that correct, Mr. Cernesy? At this point, we are not. Again, the, the, the circumstance may catch up with us along the way, too. Um, but at this point, the plan is that, that we would want to be here um, for anybody who has uh, not traveled. And we hope, we hope if you can minimize travel that you would. Um, yeah, it, it, we wouldn't be trying to put everybody together for midterms. We have, we have some, some ideas in place for some shifts so that we wouldn't have a higher level of occupancy. Um, in terms of what constitutes New England, so New Hampshire hasn't actually changed... Um, it's guideline at all. Some states, it's a fluid guideline. Um, New Hampshire basically says any travel outside of the New England states, so uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, um, constitutes a 14-day quarantine. That is under evaluation right now because the reality is that cases are high everywhere. Um, and so I, we, we think that prior to the holidays, the state may be issuing some revised guidance along that. But for right now, it's, it's those New England states. And, and just to be clear, to, to follow up on the, the midterm question, if our goal is to have all students sit for a midterm, but we would do that in a, we do that in a, a cohort model. Uh, we're working through uh, a handful of different models and plans that allow for that to happen. So all students sitting for midterms doesn't mean that, that we'd be at 100% capacity for midterms. What it would mean is we would come up with uh, a cohort plan uh, that would split groups up and split exams up in a way that would allow us to have in-person midterms. Mr. Cernsey, we had a, a start date for winter sports. Is that right? Do you remember off the top of your head what that was? was yeah, question yeah I, I believe it's November 30th they can start to do workouts and then the formal practices are roughly two weeks after that. All right. Well, thank you very much. If we missed anything, please do uh, stick around. Um, but we thank you for your uh, your support um, and appreciate you taking your time to uh, to hear us out tonight.